G'day guys, Jared Powell here, back for another instalment of On the Shoulders of Giants, where I have interesting conversations with interesting people. Well, that's the aim, anyway. Today, I'm really happy to, to bring to you a conversation that I had with Philippe Struff, a follow-up conversation, in fact, uh, on the always controversial and contentious topic of the scapula and its role in the development of shoulder pain. Particularly in this episode, we discuss the scapular assistance test. We aim to determine what it actually tests and how it may work, and also its role in clinical practice. And more importantly, we discuss if we can detect a scapular dyskinesis, do we need to correct it with our intervention in order to have a successful outcome in somebody who presents to you with shoulder pain? These are all very important topics. Anyway, without further ado, I bring to you a conversation that I have with Philippe Struff. Thanks, and I'll see you next time. All right, Philippe, uh, we're back for round two of our conversation on the always controversial scapula. Thank you for joining me again. We had some really good feedback from our last conversation which touched on the physical examination of the scapula as it relates to the shoulder. So welcome back. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Th thanks for inviting me again to the Gold Coast or wh wherever you are, <laughs> something like that. It's um, <laughs> always a privilege to do so, yeah. Yeah, no problem. And we were just, we we're just speaking about this is your last media engagement prior to your summer break. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it. What, what are your plans? Have you got anything planned? Well, uh, the, the plans are a bit mixed now because we uh, we cannot go to uh, to uh, foreign countries uh, due to the COVID uh, story. So it will be an in Belgium uh, uh, holiday today, but uh, this this summer. But uh, we have some nice places in Belgium, so uh, you should visit uh, Belgium once if you can. Uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely worth it. I've, I've been to Brussels train station uh, on the way to Germany or something from from the UK. So. I haven't been outside yeah. of it, but it was a beautiful train station. <laughs> okay, that's the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before, we, before we get into the, the theoretical stuff, um, something I've been trying to do is sort of try and reveal the personality behind uh, people that I talk to. And I haven't, I haven't given you any preparation for this. So what do, you, what do you like to do in your spare time? What are some of your hobbies and recreations? What do you enjoy doing outside of being a shoulder expert? Oh wow, well, that's a well. It's not, not not so much a difficult question because as uh, as academics, we, uh, we we don't have a lot of hobbies. We're uh, a bit of nerds in, into our uh, job. And uh, uh, but then if if we if we have some uh, some some time, there are two things that I really like to do, and that's uh, go for a walk with my dog. Uh, it's a really uh, anti stress uh, thing, and uh, you do some uh, physical activity at the same time. Uh, so that's one thing, um, and then the other thing is uh, I'm a I'm a cyclist actually. Uh, um, you wouldn't guess that from me probably, but I'm still <laughs> cycling, mountain biking, uh, etc., and uh, road cycling. Uh, that's uh, one of the national sports in Belgium. So uh, for us, it's uh, it's it's normal. It's like uh, uh, walking and 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 eating sandwiches. You have to cycle in Belgium. So uh, <laughs> that's something we, we I like to do also. Yeah, in a, in a local uh, cafe club, but uh, it's fun. Yeah. That's my spare time, uh, actually cycling and, and walking with my dog. <laughs> right, and I have that's two, a, kids. That's good. two kids. Two kids, yeah. I'm sure they occupy some time. Yeah, they're two. They're still young. Uh, nine, oh, sorry, ten. It's ten since yesterday. Ten and uh, twelve. So uh, they're uh, they're grow they're growing, but uh, it's it's fun. Two daughters, and um, uh, I hope they um, make some sense in their lives. <laughs> <One day. laughs> well, that's that's great. So 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 cycling. Um, cycling is such a European, well, at least road cycling anyway, very uh, historical sort of leisure activity in Europe. And I think I was watching a Lance Armstrong documentary the other day and uh, his team manager, was it Johan Brunil? He was, was he, he's Belgian? Yeah, he's Belgian, yeah. Yeah. So uh, there you go. He's a, he's a famous Belgian cyclist or at least part of the Lance Armstrong story, which we won't discuss. Okay, so <laughs> cycling aside and Lance Armstrong aside, let's, uh, let's talk about the shoulder and specifically the scapula. So last time we talked about the 
inaccuracy and potentially biased uh, view of the scapula when we try and assess it with our vision. Our vision is historically uh, quite poor or can be poor. It can be prone to bias as any of our senses can be. So a way to offset that or troubleshoot that problem has been this, uh, the scapula assistance test has been devised. Now the scapula assistance test is essentially promoting upward rotation and maybe a bit of posterior tilt of the scapula manually. So the therapist doing it or somebody else doing it. Could you speak a little bit about this scapula assistance test if you use it in your practice? And if you do, why do you use it? Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, it's, it's actually maybe the best, uh, the best question um, to discuss about. This is really scapular assistant test because by discussing that test, you can, you can discuss several other things related to the scapula and to the shoulders. So, well, um, the scapula, well, we, we have several tests uh, developed, I think maybe 10, 10, 15 years ago, they were developed um, as a sort of a mod a symptom modification tests using the scapula. And uh, you got the scapular assistant test, which focused on upward rotation, and the modified scapular assistant test, which which you can push the uh, inferior angle and, and pull out towards the coracoid to make some posterior tilt, together with the upward rotation. Then uh, also these tests like uh, scapular retraction test and repositioning tests, which are actually using a, a pain provocative test com combined with retraction or uh, posterior tilt, but which but they all have the same intention. And their idea was, if you perform these tests um, and the patient's complaints reduced, well, then um, the, the scapula might play a, a big role. And um, the, the explanation for pain reduction has changed over the last 15 years. Uh, the first uh, time it was developed and published, there was times, I think it was uh, Angela Tate and uh, Philip McClure who, who published a lot on that. They... Um, they said that it was all about, or mainly about the mechanism um, behind uh, in, uh, assisting or increasing upward rotation or increasing posterior tilt, uh, which would uh, be, which would have an effect on the supracromial space. Uh, that was the first uh, explanation. So if you uh, increase upward rotation, if you increase posterior tilt, then maybe the supracromial space increases and maybe that's the reason for um, reduction in pain. And then uh, that would be a cue to uh, steer your rehabilitation towards uh, scapular training, uh, towards posterior tilt and upward rotation. So that was the, the, the main thing. It's still, it, that's still alive, by the way. It's not that it's uh, uh, gone, that, that uh, rationale, but it's, it's still alive. But that was one, I think, 10, 50 years ago. And then afterwards, there were also other uh, uh, ideas because, of course, uh, the whole uh, supracromial space relevance uh, is getting in some uh, debate on that and um, uh, a lot of uh, studies have been published since then that really discuss the relevance of it and then of course if you discuss the relevance of that then you might also need to discuss the relevance of what are you doing with the scapular assistant test because if you think you're uh, doing upward rotation for increasing supracromial space and that's the reason why patients have reduction in complaints well, that, that doesn't really make sense if your uh, next study is, well, the supracromial space doesn't matter. Um, so this, is, this was a bit uh, conflicting. And then um, other ideas, other uh, hy hypotheses were developed um, to, to talk about why, why a lot of people have pain reduction. I see in my, clinical, in my clinic that a lot of patients feel better when I do the scapular assistant test. And I always are wondering why, why, why is this? Um, and there was this study that, that, that said, okay, it's ju just because you put your hands on the, on the shoulder, you, you have some tactile uh, feedback and it feels good for the patient, feels confident. And that's, it's more like a touching effect uh, of your hands. But then uh, other pilot studies, uh, not, not, not big powered, but there were some studies who, who did a sham comparison. So you, you just put your hands on, you don't do the assistant, you don't do the posterior tilt, you just put your hands on. But then uh, they saw that the uh, pain reducing effect was a lot less than, than when you really performed the test. So it might not be the, the touch uh, alone. Um, and then I think we're now uh, 2020 and since a few years, um, the uh, intrinsic role of the cuff is getting more and more attention. And um, I think we should definitely look at the scapular assistant test 
um, as um, a factor affecting the intrinsic role of the cuff. So if you, I'm gonna give a, a, a very um, um, clear example, which, which might not be completely correct, but it's, a, it's I think, a good example. Um, if you move your arm with a, with a weight or, or whatever, your deltoid is, is highly active and other muscles, but your deltoid is really performing that movement. When the deltoid is performing that movement, then uh, your humeral head is challenged because the deltoid pulls on the, on the humeral head. And it's our cuff that is dynamically active to, to stabilize the humeral head during that movement. So the more activity you uh, ask from your deltoids, the more activity normally the, the rotator cuff should apply to, to get it all um, uh, at its place. But of course, if you have a lot of uh, cuff activity and you have a lot of cuff load, then this cuff attaches to the scapula and the scapula is pulled towards um, internal rotation, so the winging, um, during that activity. So the more cuff activity, then the more the scapula is challenged towards internal rotation and the more the serratus and the trapezius needs to be uh, active and strong to, to keep the scapula controlled. Because only if the scapula is controlled, then the cuff can have its uh, perfect uh, length tension uh, relationship to, to stabilize the, the humeral head, dynamically stabilize, stabilize the humeral head. So um, the more cuff loading, the more the trapezius is challenged and, and vice versa. So I think this is a, um, a, a chain that you can hardly separate. And uh, that's why I think that might be a role for um, a cuff um, uh, problems when patients have positive assistance test. So I mean, if, uh, if I perform a scapular assistance test and the pain, patient has pain reduction, I rather think now, eh, 10 years ago, it would be a really a scapular problem. Now I think we, we have some um, cues that might that may be um, emphasizing that it's a cuff, cuff related issue because you, you actually create a stable base, basis for the cuff and you, uh, if you do the assistant test, you really help the cuff in performing that movement. So actually you, you, you unload, you do an unloading of the cuff by performing the scapular assistant test. And if you look at it that way, then the a positive test actually tells you that if you, un, if you unload the cuff and you have pain reduction, that the complaints of the patients are load related. Yeah? Would actually tells you then on the uh, again that load might be a, a preferential uh, uh, intervention um, towards the cuff. So that's maybe something different from uh, the the interpretation of a few years ago. But I think that might be an interesting path to think about. Um, we also saw some um, uh, studies um, uh, relating the scapular assistant test with uh, cuff tears, for instance. So that was also a study emphasizing that. Uh, in case of cuff tear, that the patient had m much more positive uh, assistance tests versus the patients who did not have any uh, cuff tears. So in that was also the, the author said, okay, maybe these uh, 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 scapular symptom modification tests tell you more about the cuff than it tells you about the scapula. And it definitely doesn't tell you anything about uh, scapular dyskinesis because the, the, that, that's not the... the the thing you do with the uh, assistant or retraction test, it's your scapular dyskinesis, what we discussed uh, last time, is if, if you, you, can, you can just visually observe that in, if, if it's there. So um, you don't need the scapular assistant test for that. Um, and a positive scapular assistant test doesn't tell me anything on the scapula is the, the, the cause or, or a consequence of the problem, but it might tell you something that it's um, load related and that um, uh, incorporating, of course, the scapula in your rehabilitation program might be, might be benefit, beneficial for your patient. Um, but then there is another uh, next point where we can discuss that later is how, how, how do you do that? Huh? Um, so that's my, my, my first idea on the scapular assistant test, going from a supracromial space reduction story to, to touching to, well, maybe it's more about the cuff uh, uh, during that test. And we should really consider the cuff perf while performing a scapular assistant test. Um, and maybe it's not the loading alone. Maybe it's also the length tension you, you, you create. Maybe it's uh, just putting the, 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 the glenoid in, a, in an, a better position biomechanically. I, I don't know. It's, it's still not really clear. Uh, maybe there are other reasons, but um, it might be more than uh, um, uh, scapular dyskinesis. In, 
at, at the end, it's, it's definitely, in my opinion, it's definitely not using that test to, to uh, decide whether a patient has capillary dyskinesis or not. That's not, that's not the goal of the test, I think. Okay, that's, that's excellent. So if I, if I can just briefly summarize, and that was very well said. Yeah. So we've come a long way from the scapular assistance test as essentially meaning that there's a subacromial space issue. So now so we've, we've gone from that and then this concept of touch came into play and are we just affecting or playing with somebody's cognitions or emotions? And that still might be relevant in some people, I would say. And then we're sort of, and this is, and I agree with your point, it's, are we just offloading sensitized tissue by facilitating a movement or creating, going from an active movement to an active assisted movement? And I think maybe it's a combination of all three in terms of the mechanism of action. So the problem is in, in a lot of the time in the literature, though, it's the, the suggestion is that if the scapular assistance test is positive, then we must direct our treatment at the scapula because it's a scapular dyskinesis issue. And what you've very articulately said is that, well, maybe not, maybe the problem is with a weak or, or maybe load intolerant rotator cuff complex. So, so that is, that is a big change really from when you look at the literature. I was just looking at a paper before that I'm doing a bit, a bit of a review on from 2018 uh, by Rabin. And it says that still, the, if a scapular assistance test is positive, then the assumption is that we must go on and treat the scapula. But nobody has ever done that study. Nobody has ever got, okay, here's a group of people with a positive scapular assistance test. Do those people need scapular intervention or do they just need progressive strengthening and then compare the two and follow them up? That study has not been done. So, so if, you, if you do get a scapular assistance test, and I know it may be uh, a positive scapular assistance test and it may be different for every single person, but for the average person, how would that direct your subsequent intervention? Would you focus on progressive loading of the shoulder? Well, yeah. Well, the, just to come back to the to the scapular assistance test, um, I sometimes think it's it's um, it's it's really easy indeed to blame the scapula if if you do something with the scapula and the patient has pain reduction. It's, it, it it sounds logic to do something with the scapula, but you can also compare this with a. I sometimes compare it for my students with a, if you if you drive with drive with your car over a, a cobblestones. And you really go hard, you go uh, 200 miles per hour uh, on the cobblestones, and you get a flat tire. Okay, you get a flat tire, and um, then uh, you, it's easy to say, okay, how are we going to fix this problem? Your your uh, your speed is gone. You're, you're you're there on the on the cobblestones, and you can say, okay, what's the problem? You can, the flat tire is the problem, and uh, but actually that that might not be the, the issue. The, the whole issue is you are speeding on on a cobblestone. Um, so that that's a bit the same um, discussion, I think. Yeah, okay, there is there is a flat. Okay, the the, the trapezius and the, and the serrata are letting this movement go for some reason, uh, or they can't, or they won't, or whatever. Um, but that doesn't mean that's that's the biggest issue. The, uh, that's the biggest thing. Maybe there is something else going on. Why why is this happening? Uh, for instance, the um, <clears throat> I'm I'm just thinking about the author. I think it's Manske uh, who did a study on the um, uh, or presented one of the uh, um, other uh, scapular tests like the scapular flip sign um, in which you um, which is very easy test in which you need to perform an uh, external rotation against resistance and then during the external rotation against resistance you just look at the scapula and if the scapula starts to wing that was a positive scapular flip sign and then the conclusion was you, you have some you have a problem at your, your scapula eh? um, so that's that's a bit the same thing but from the from the strength rationale, it's, it's quite logic. Again, you do the external rotation, the, the infraspinatus and, and, and the posterior cuff, all the posterior cuff and the deltoids are working a lot. And uh, of course, they, they pull on the, on the scapula and maybe in these patients, uh, the, the traps and the, and the serratus, they don't have the strength or they won't want to have the strength or you need this, the internal rotation for uh, sufficient cuff activity and the, and the serratus, and they just do, don't do anything just to fix to fix the, the, the issue, um, whatever your attention is uh, went to the to the scapula. 
Um, okay, that's just something on the on the assistance test again. Uh, then your last, sorry, your last question on the when when I have a positive test in clinical practice. Yeah, so so when you have the positive test, do you you and you touched on this a moment ago? Do you take this as a sign that you need to increase the strength or the capacity of the rotator cuff, or do you just view it as a sign I've got to I've got to apply some sort of load to the entirety of the of the shoulder complex, including scapula, thoracic muscle, muscles, rotator cuff muscles, deltoid pecs, lats, all of the above. How do how do you then deal with a positive uh, scapula assistance test? That's that's the, the that's the big question, of course. Yeah, um, that's also a, maybe a bit, a bit difficult question indeed because. Um, like ten years ago, that would be the the goal of yeah okay let's let's focus on the scapula alone, eh? especially if you have a, a large pain reduction because that's something that's uh, something we we use more and more that's the uh, or the, the literature uses more and more that's the amount of pain reduction during that test eh? if you have seven on ten during a, a normal movement and during the scapula assistant test you go to six then they say okay maybe the upper rotation is important but actually not so much it's just one point uh, reduction so you don't really need to focus on that but if it goes from seven to zero to one yeah then that would be an idea you only need to do something about scapula and and all the rest isn't isn't that important the good thing is that if you uh, if you want to do something about scapula you need to you need to trigger the cuff um that's the that's the 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 best direction if you really want if you if you're convinced that the scapula is a problem so that's that's still a discussion but if you're convinced that's the problem you still need to need to use the cuff to do to do the whole work and um, so if your patient has a pain reduction you might think that it's all about the, your uh, scapular focus treatment but actually it might be uh, your great cuff loading you've done uh, during your exercises because that's i'm not sure maybe we discussed that last uh, uh, chat also i'm not sure about um, if you want to challenge the scapula in, in uh, um, or you, if you want to challenge the, the trapezius and the serratus, well, you need to challenge the cuff, otherwise these muscles won't do anything. Um, so it, it, these go, go together and you cannot separate them in, in any way. And so the good thing is in your rehabilitation process, uh, from the start that you start moving your arm, you're doing it, you're doing it all, uh, uh, it all together. And there are only a few patients maybe that... Uh, really have a problem with um, scapular control uh, even with without any loading um, at all and in these patients it's, it might be suggested to do some uh, some some first some uh, uh, orientation exercises uh, some uh, um, uh, posterior tilt uh, activity or some focus on the serrata some push exercises some uh, focus on the trapezius um, maybe in these specific patients, which there is immediately a lot of til tilting and winging, uh, just by, by moving the arm, even unloaded, uh, you might uh, consider that. But even, um, um, even if you start with these orientation exercises, you will need to go towards uh, cuff loading quite fast. And um, then maybe the, the, uh, I think the progression might be a little bit, uh, um, uh, how do you say that? Um, slower uh, the progression might be very low from low load not not the highest load again so that's something i i use so i use the my progression and you can maybe look at the scapula as some sort of uh, sign whether or not your cuff loading is is um, is adequate uh, I'm, i don't know whether i make sense uh, uh, but i it's it, from the moment that's that's what often is suggested now in literature also Maybe the, these scapular winging or, or this, this kinesis is some, some sort of um, first sign that, that the cuff isn't coping with the load. Uh, so maybe that if you increase your cuff loading, that you can use, okay, whether or not the scapula is a bit controlled, you can still increase your, your cuff load. From the moment on the scapula is starting to, to wing or winging or tilting, that maybe your load on the cuff at that time might be too much uh, and the scapula is trying to to fix the, the whole thing um, so maybe you can rather use it in your progression rather to, than that than say okay now I'm only doing uh, uh, I'm only trying to activate some scapular things or only trying to activate the cuff because they're 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 one and the, they're, they're one system yeah no that's that's very well said and it comes back to like the famous you know scapular strengthening exercise is a scaption exercise often in prone 
and that's just a damn good rotator cuff exercise as well. So why, yeah. I, I don't get why we're wasting our time in trying to differentiate. We've got to do scapula only exercises or scapula corrective exercise, unless like you suggested, there is profound scapular dyskinesia, even with unloaded movements. And that person just has no control of their shoulder as a result of a very unstable or disconnected scapula. In that instance, yeah. I can understand it. But for somebody who has a degree or two of dyskinesia, potentially, then I just can't understand why we need to divide the two systems. It's, it's all the same. So well, I agree. Yeah, that's, um, that's the, the really anatomical view on rehabilitation, the structural view on rehabilitation we, we've had for, for decades, of course. Mm. Uh, um, that's um, maybe if, if, you're, if it's okay, I can discuss the, the, the randomized trial we did in uh, 2013. Yep. Go for it. Or actually, the randomized trial we published in 2013, but it was done in I think 2011 or something like that. And that was the time really that. Um, so this uh, is so just so this is your your this is your paper. What's what's it called for anybody who wants to go and listen uh, look it up? Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a good question. How, how was this beautiful? It's ten years ago, Jared. <laughs> um, it's um, scapular focus treatment in uh, uh, supracromial impingement or something like that. Uh, in, uh, a randomized control trial. A randomized control trial, 2013. Uh, I think it's clinical rheumatology. It was published in. I'm 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 even that. I'm not sure actually. <laughs> Um, well, anyway, that was, that was part of my PhD in that time, uh, but actually it was published after my uh, PhD defense, but anyway, um, and in that uh, time we, um, we were thinking, okay, let's, um, let's take a grab of uh, impingement uh, patients uh, at that time, uh, and uh, let's divide them into a, a patients that have positive symptom modification tests and, and patients that do not have positive symptom modification tests. And with the idea that some uh, patients will have benefit of scapular treatment and the others uh, m maybe not. And so um, we've got we, modification test, the scapular assistance test, or something yeah, else? Scapular, yeah, scapular system. Scapular system. Okay. So uh, we divided them in. Okay, these patients have scapular assistance, a positive scapular assistance test, and the others did not have scap a positive scapular assistance test. And then we gave the, these patients with a positive scapular assistant test a scapular focused uh, treatment. So and I will explain immediately what we, th what we thought it was a scapular focused treatment. And the other group, well, we thought, okay, let's, let's just do the, uh, the standard physical therapy for, um, for impingement problems. And um, I will tell you right, right away what the standard uh, conservative intervention was. That was actually some uh, mobilizations of the glenohumeral joint uh, we did some um, external rotation exercises with, with a band. I don't know if you can, uh, you can see that. It is really with a band. You can, you can imagine yep. some external yep. rotation exercises. Um, and then um, I have to think if we did anything more. I, I'm not sure. Maybe. Uh, I, I think, I think you did, did a. Good. Did you do an eccentric exercise as well? We did eccentric exercises. Um, but, but actually, only in, in, uh, in, in almost all, all in, the, in the zero uh, rest position. Okay. Um, and then some ultrasound even I think that times um, so that was the, the conservative intervention and then for nine times and then the other intervention was scapular focus and uh, we first for the scapular focused we were uh, um, that time we were uh, uh, how you said really close with the uh, kinetic control uh, concept uh, um, um, company uh, which um, developed uh, the scapular orientation exercise. I think it's a, a paper from Sarah Matram who uh, published that a scapular orientation exercise, in which you um, you put your fingers on the coracoid and you need to uh, pull the, the coracoid away from your fingers, which may, creates a posterior tilt of the scapula. And then you, by doing that, you activate your uh, um, uh, trapezius and serratus. But actually, we start with that exercise. But then we um, included a lot of movements uh, during this, this control. So the, 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 the instruction was, okay, if you do a posterior tilt, with that posterior tilt, now we're going to do uh, elevation, abduction, rotations. Uh, we're going to do stability exercises in, in, in uh, um, hand and knee uh, position. Um, we're going to do uh, training with, with load, with bands uh, going, going up. And um, also in prone uh, doing exercises, going to uh, uh, lateral and well, a lot of a lot of uh, training uh, with uh, 
which we thought this is this is all scapula focused. And we saw in nine sessions that the conservative intervention they improved, but they actually they didn't improve that much. Uh, but the scapula focused intervention they improved a lot. And um, the first th thought was okay. Um, this is really a, 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 um, a, a something that. Uh, emphasizes the fact that you need to classify your patient into having a scapular dyskinesis or not, and then you can steer your rehabilitation towards the scapular intervention. So that has the better outcome. Um, and that made sense also, <clears throat> apart from the fact, two, two discussion points here. One um, is the fact that um, um, we also measured the scapula. We measured the scapular positioning. We had inclinometers and calipers, and we measured it all. And the, uh, the idea was, okay, if the patient improves due to our scapula-focused treatment, then probably also the scapular position or, or movement will, will change over time. Um, but with the measurements we did, we didn't see any change of the scapula uh, over these nine sessions. And I think the nine sessions were divided over, or oh, I'm, 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 I have to recall this, I think it was one or two, Two, uh, two interventions per week. So, and we saw that actually the scapular positioning did not change at all uh, over that time. So maybe of course our clinical tools weren't sensitive enough. That's, that's one option. That's the first we thought then. Or uh, what we're doing actually doesn't affect, affect the scapular positioning at all. Eh? And, or it doesn't really matter at all, maybe also. Um, and then of course the second, if we look at this uh, trial now, um, actually, the intervention, the scapula-focused intervention, is now there are now uh, uh, great rotative exercises. They're, they're perfect rotative exercises, and uh, we might be training our rotative patients. Yes, and the other, the control group was just doing nothing. So that may, might be the reason for the big improvement. We don't know, but uh, actually, it's it's funny how your interpretation change of the same study can in, can change over the years. You look at it. Um, so that's um, yeah, that makes it some, some, sometimes more complex. But I think we did we did a better and and uh, loading of the cuff in the scapula focused intervention than just in a standard intervention. Um, that's our, our conclusion now. And the conclusion in 2013 was it's a it's a scapula you need to uh, you need to focus on and and only maybe only in case of a positive uh, symptom modification test. But actually, that's a conclusion you cannot make because. Um, we didn't include the scapular focus treatment in the other group. So only then uh, that would make sense maybe, but uh, we, we didn't. So that's the, the uh, research is never, uh, it's never perfect. And uh, I think we yeah. need to admit that, that also we have, if we've done the research uh, ourselves, it has added something to the whole discussion, um, uh, this uh, RCT, but uh, we must admit that uh, it, it wasn't perfect and that the, our interpretations at that time uh, might not be the best interpretations. But uh, who says our interpretations now, uh, Jared, are the, are the best? I don't know. <laughs> we just uh, work with the things we have uh, at, uh, at that time. Uh, that's the only option we have, of course. Yeah, no, I think that's really honest of you to, to say that. A lot, of, a lot of people stick to their opinions regardless of what the actual data suggests. So, so that's, that's funny to sort of track the interpretation of the same data set over the last 10 years and it, and now so you were the lead author in that and now it's essentially maybe we had the best rotator cuff strengthening exercise in the scapula focus group as opposed to the scapula focus uh is is, is correcting scapular kinematics which it didn't do in your paper and there's been a number of control randomized control trials since then and also a couple of systematic reviews and it, they very rarely, I think, I don't think I've really seen any good randomized control trials that show a substantial improvement in scapular kinematics after a scapular focus treatment, although pain and function improve and, and, and sometimes improve better than a general strengthening regime in the short term, but that's often lost by sort of 12 weeks. Or, or even earlier sometimes. So, is there, so can I say, based on your paper and then based on papers that have come out since then, that the resolution or the improvement of scapular dyskinesis is not required to improve pain and function? Um, 
we don't have any evidence to say otherwise. <laughs> Um, so it's, I'm, I, I'm not sure. I think you can, I, in my clinic also, I see a lot of patients with um, scapular dyskinesis and uh, rotator cuff issues, which are uh, rehabilitated towards the rotator cuff problem and they get better. And at the end, they go home with, with the same scapular dyskinesis, but they're, they're okay. So it's, uh, it's, it's really not um, the, the holy grail, I think, uh, indeed. And it's, it, it might be, um, might be either a, a, a movement pattern that's just different between uh, between people. Like we we have different way of walking, we have different way of uh, of moving our uh, our scapula, or um, it's it's yeah it it might be a thing. But actually, um, and, and that's the whole idea about about the scapular focused treatments. Actually, they they make sense in 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 reducing pain because the best that's that's the thing i said in the beginning the best scapular uh, focus treatment are those who activate the cuff the most because otherwise you cannot have a scapular focused intervention so either you have pain reduction and your scapular focus treatment was a great uh, rotator cuff activity or you don't have pain reduction but then maybe your uh, scapular focus treatment didn't make sense because you weren't loading the cuff in the right way so it's the 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 scap the scapula focus treatment is defined by a good cuff activity, and and that just well if if you go from that go from there then it's it, it's um, a waste of time to discuss all the differentiation indeed. So you can you can discuss that for years, but actually it's a it's one system in our body, and the the, the one only works when the other activates. So we 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 need to let that go, I think, and. Uh, we can still use it, I think, to to track progression. Maybe maybe there is something going on with the uh, with the load uh, with the load capacity. And what I said uh, early on, maybe there's something on with the load uh, capacity, and we can use the scapula as some sort of uh, trigger. And that reminds me of the of the papers from uh, um, uh, Merit and Muller uh, about uh, the the prediction of shoulder pain when there is scapular dyskinesis going on. Where the suggestion was also okay, maybe the scapular dyskinesis is like the the, um, how did we say that the the bird in the the canary in the mine? Huh? Um, yeah. it's, it's the first sign, uh, but it's not the, the canary. The canary is not the problem <laughs> in the mine. Yeah. It's something yeah. else a problem, but it's yeah. the first sign. Maybe it's something that can gives you an idea of okay, my, there might be something going on, but that doesn't mean you you just need to uh, replace the canary and it's and it's uh, it's, it's it's solved. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's exactly right. It's it's not the scapular dyskinesis in isolation. It's when it's coupled with something else. But I like your point in that maybe a scapular dyskinesis is revealing something about the strength of that person's shoulder. And maybe it could be a trigger or a sign that we need to improve that person's strength and conditioning. However, it may not correct that scapular dyskinesis and the trigger may always remain. So. So that's something that we just may have to, to deal with. Um, okay, that's, well, that's, I, think, I think we can, oh, do you wanna say something? Yeah, well, it just, it, it's, uh, um, we, we see that in, in swimmers, for instance. Eh? A lot of swimmers have scapular dyskinesis at baseline, but if you put them in the water and you let them train for, for an hour, then scapular dyskinesis is, is really increasing in incidence. Uh, so uh, they go from like 20% scapular dyskinesis prevalence to 80% at the end of training. So there is indeed a, a relation with, with, with the presence of scapular dyskinesis and the loading of the system. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's more important than than saying okay, it's uh, it's there is someone to blame or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. So so fatigue and load can really sort of make the scapular dyskinesis far more prominent. But again, yeah. we don't have to correct the dyskinesis, we correct the load, right? So it's, it's about getting yeah. the focus in the right place. And this is the key point. It's focusing so. yeah. not on the dyskinesis, but on the load tolerance of the system. And I think, I hope we can make that point clear for everybody. Um, okay, so let's, let's move on from that because we're pretty, we're pretty clear on that. And I feel like we're, we're beating a bit of a dead horse there. But as we discussed a moment ago, we, it's clear to us and clear to a lot of people in the shoulder community, but, but, but the clinicians at large, we still tend to focus or, or on that scapular dyskinesis factor. So we're beating a dead horse for a reason. So what about 
what about just quickly for, before I take up too much of your time? Manual therapy. So, so manual therapy for, and I'm going to, I'm going to direct this more towards the scapula. I know there's not a lot of literature on that, but just as a hypothetical or a conceptual point, manual therapy directed towards structures that are meant to be causing the scapula dyskinesia, like a tight pectoralis or a tight trapezius or a tight levator scapula, and I say tight in inverted commas. And then what about taping? Does taping have a role to play in the management of people with a scapular dyskinesia, number one, or people with subacromial shoulder pain or rotator cuff related shoulder pain? What do you think? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, well, from a from a research point of view, as you as you mentioned, it it will be difficult to give clear uh, and strong recommendations for now because it's uh, it's it's very complex. It's like our trial in 2013. We're now uh, changing the the rationale uh, uh, ten years later. So that's that's the same for uh, the uh, the use of, of manual therapy because if you do a trial, um, you will be doing several things together with the manual therapy, and then if the patient get better, we all, we, we never know what really know what. What was the reason for the patient getting better? But of course, there is a, a clinical rationale. And um, if a patient has a scapular dyskinesis, if a patient has a positive symptom modification test, scapular modification test, and you think, okay, um, it might be important. Uh, we don't say it's scapula to blame, but it might be important to include the whole, uh, the whole shoulder, the whole load training. But really, this patient has a lot of um, um, uh, tilting and, and a lot of internal rotation. Scapula is really very protracted. And it's uh, in that case also related to uh, the patient's job, for instance. He's, a, he's an office worker and he's always in that position. Then you might assume, okay, maybe this patient has a, has a tight uh, pec minor or a tight uh, levator scapula or, or rhomboids. It's, it's an assumption, of course. You, you, we don't know that, but you, you might assume that. Uh, and that might play a role in uh, the whole scapular positioning. It might play a role in the, the position of the cuff then. Uh, so maybe the cuff will have more issues in that position. Um, so in that case, from the clinical rationale, you might say, okay, maybe in addition to, in addition to the exercise therapy, uh, maybe some uh, pec minor stretching or levato stretchers, the stretchings might be uh, beneficial. And if we look at, uh, at the trials we do have, um, because, for instance, in, in our trial in 2013, we did also these stretches, uh, by the way, in the scapula focus treatment. We did a levator stretch, pec minor stretch, and rhomboid stretch as home exercises, all three. And um, we, had, we, had, <clears throat> we had the effect, so we could, we could also say it's, it's due to the manual therapy that we have the, the effect. We, we, we don't know that. Uh, but from a clinical rationale, that it might make sense. From a research point of view, we don't know actually. Um, and uh, if if research reveals some success, it's it's mainly short term. Um, uh, the results uh, we don't know whether it has any long term effects. If the patient keeps on doing his job, uh, and you can keep on stretching it manually, but I think a, a lifestyle uh, um, coaching would be more <laughs> beneficial in that case. And and uh, some training that the patient can 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 do uh, his job better might be a lot of uh, more interesting. But I can imagine it can have some um, additional um, additional effects and maybe uh, also in um, increase compliance a bit. Um, this is maybe a difficult one because I see that that's that's not this is not research. I'm I'm, I'm telling you, but it's more uh, if if I compare it, it's a lot of discussions with me and my colleagues doing shoulder patients that we a lot of, a lot of them uh, do uh, really do active treatment alone. And, um, and some of them do like 50-50 manual therapy with, with active treatment. And we see on some, somehow that the compliance of the patients uh, where there is also manual therapy in is, is often larger, is often bigger than, than in, the, in the active therapy alone. Maybe it's only in the Belgian population, I don't know, but somehow they, uh, uh, the patient feels often more, um, uh, there's more attention on them uh, and they, they, they feel more understood when there's also some, some passive intervention and they, uh, that gives them a lot of trigger to keep on exercising. And if, if that's the case in your patient, and uh, everything is good as long as they keep on exercising and uh, also maybe manual therapy, maybe taping. Uh, maybe taping is something that a patient needs as a, as a reminder that he needs to exercise. 
And if it's useful as a reminder to, to exercise, it's great, but I don't think we can imagine, we can uh, assume that the taping will be uh, the, uh, the holy grail, the, the golden bullet in his rehabilitation process, because that doesn't really make, make sense um, that a tape will, will do the thing. Um, also from research in, in shoulder pain patients, taping is, uh, is, is always had uh, or either no results or a short-term uh, result. Um, and the short term is really after taping, not not the day afterwards. So it's really after after the hours or the minutes after taping. So um, you can imagine the, the the placebo effect there also, of course. Or yeah, and it, 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 yeah, it often yeah. just affects pain as well. So it's not really improving function or changing mechanics or normalizing movement or anything like that, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's not not only a placebo effect. You can also have some. Uh, um, uh, input there uh, towards the, the somatosensoric um, uh, cortex uh, by, by using that tape. So it's, it might have a, a pain inhibition effect, um, but it's, it's all good as if, if, the, if this triggers a patient to, to, uh, to exercise, I think. Yeah, I think that's a very good, moderate <laughs> in, interpretation of all of that, you know, because it's, 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 it's a bit of a it's a bit of an emotional discussion these days amongst therapists in terms of manual therapy and taping and all of these adjunct passive treatments that potentially there is a role and maybe if it reduces pain and as you suggested, improves compliance and then encourages people to move on with their exercise. We don't need to talk about the mechanism of action and the neuromodulation or neurophysiological effects of all of this stuff. I think the key message here is exercise is probably the champion of the treatment or the central point of the treatment and other things may just come and go. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, it's, it's big, a lot of patient specific if you use uh, manual therapy or taping or, or other things because it can, uh, for instance, it can increase compliance. But on the other hand, um, there's, a, there's also the, the other side, of course, that in some patients, we don't want to uh, create too much dependence on the, on the therapist also. So we want to, to make them, um, uh, to, to have self-efficacy of the patient. We want to make them dependent on their own. And if we do too much or, or we emphasize too much on the manual therapy, the patient might think, okay, he's, he's treating me and I'm doing a little bit of exercises also, but I'm, he's treating me. And that's not the, the way we want to go, but that's really patient dependent, I think. Some will need that and encourage them to train and others, it's, it's maybe too much and you need to reduce it to, to focus on the intervention to make sure they're not de too dependent on, on you. Um, but that's yeah. the, the, yeah. the, the great ex exciting thing of every patient is different uh, in your practice. Yeah, and this is what patient-centered care is all about. <laughs> you've got you've to use what you've got in order to help that person in front of you. And just as long as you're doing things for the right reason, you're not creating any dependencies and, and reducing self-efficacy, which you suggested, <laughs> then... I'm okay for you to use what you want to use as long as movement is the champion of the regime. I can't even remember the last time I put tape on somebody's shoulder. It would have been yeah. many, many, many years ago. So anyway, I think, I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stop there. You probably got to get to work or go for a cycle or walk the dog or whatever you've got to do. Uh, so, so thank you for having, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Thanks for having another discussion with me about the scapula. Uh, I hope some people get some value out of it and I'll direct people towards uh, your paper from 2013. I think it might be very interesting for, for everybody to have a read about. So thank you, Philippe, and enjoy your summer break. Thanks, Jared. It was very nice to talk to you and a very good uh, discussion, I think. Very important one. Yeah. Right. Cheers, mate.